Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757 230 2110. How are you? We are starting a new series. I'm super excited about it because I think God wants every life to count. That's what we're talking about today, how to make your life count. If you're joining us online, I want to welcome you. Thanks for being part of what we're doing here. And uh, I think God's got an amazing word uh, that we can learn from him about how to make our life count even more. You know, for so many of us, we are very, very interested in time-saving devices because it seems to help, right? So we've got our smartphone helping us. We've got our uh, electronic calendar, and we have Alexa, and we have Google, and we have uh, all kinds of, you know, the GPS, anything to help us save time and shave off time. And, uh, and some of you might be thinking, hey, I'm hoping he's going to help me to work harder in even less time, and that's not what I'm going to do. So if that's, actually, I think for most, most of us, we, our schedules are too busy. They're too full. So what we're going to talk about today, though, is something I think is even more important. And it's about managing the time that is unmanageable. You know, you read these time management books, and it sounds like all of your time is under your control. You know, it's, everything's manageable. But the truth is, we have things that come our way that completely disrupt us. I mean, they, you know, some kind of irritation or inconvenience, maybe an illness, some delay, something that happens that throws us off kilter, off center. We're not, we're, we feel like our whole schedule's now on, you know, on its side. What do you do in that circumstance? Well, we're going to look at a guy who was very, very busy, very wealthy, very influential, and one of the wisest men who ever lived, maybe the wisest, a guy named Solomon. He wrote a book called Ecclesiastes. So if you have your Bible, open that up. We're going to look at some of the, 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 what he had to say there. And we're going to look primarily in, in uh, chapter 3. If you have your Bible app, you can open that, click on that. Solomon has a lot to say about that. He says, who can say how one's days can best be spent? How do you know how to spend your days, your time? Is there a right and a wrong? Is there a better and a best? How do we best do that? And he says, hey, when you're thinking through this question, you need to have at least four things that you have in mind. You have to look at your life, how you spend your time, in four different ways. Number one is you have to recognize that God's plan for my life includes both good and bad. Both good and bad times. Now, for most of us, we wouldn't choose the bad, right? We're not dumb. We're not, hey, give me a second helping of bad. No. If we could plan out our life, it would include all good. It would, it would just be great. And then we would end up spoiled brats, right? I mean, we just end up, who knows what we'd look like. Because the truth is, who we are today and some of the good things in our lives about us, the things that people most appreciate, maybe we even most value, came from some of the most difficult things we've gone through. It's, that's part of the way life happens. It's Even though we would never ask for that, we don't want that. We don't ask for that for our kids or want that, or our grandkids. But part, we know that good things can come out of that, right? And that's what he's saying is that it's part of God's plan. You have to recognize that God is in even the difficult places in your life. Even the times that you're going, well, wait a minute, that financial 
uh, loss that I'm, that I, God can be in, he can work in that. He can be in the middle of that. Sometimes we just see God as maybe he's in our Bible study for prayer, if we're at church. The truth is God is often in the mundane things, in the things that we don't even recognize he would be a part of, but he is, he's right there. It says there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. So he says there's all, no matter what it is. And he actually gives these categories. He lists them out, 28 things, he says, and he kind of contrasts them. It's not exhaustive, but it's, it's kind of a, a, a cross of life showing you the different seasons. And right out of the bat, he goes ahead and he lists the first thing that you absolutely have no control over, and that's when you're born. Right? You couldn't control when you were born, what family you were born into, which country you were born. None of that. That was totally not in your control. And, and, and he says, that's unmanageable, and so is your death. A lot of times we want to know when we die, right? It helps when we're trying to plan out retirement. How much will I need? That's big anxiety. No matter how much money you have, then one of the top anxieties for people, uh, for Americans, is how much money will I need, you know, in retirement? Because you can't plan that out. You don't know. Right? You say, well, what about suicide? You can try to control it that way. Well, that certainly is not God's best. And this, past, this past Tuesday was Suicide Awareness Day, and that is a problem. There's certainly uh, mental health plays a, a role in that, depression and so forth. And, but we, we certainly have uh, a ways of influencing that. But really, our death is not in our control, nor is our birth. He says, show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. He can pray that all he wants, but he's not going to know. He goes, I'd like to know what it is, but I do know that it comes quicker than I anticipated. Then he goes and lists some other ones. He says there's a time to plant and a time to un up uproot. You know, there is a time to plant. There is a time to plant your roots somewhere. That is what God has for some of you. Some of you, it's time for you to plant your roots in this church. You've been coming for a while, and you've been kind of circling the wagons, thinking about it, kicking the tires. Well, the, you've kicked all the tires. There's only four. You know, I mean, that's it. It's time to either, you know, and, and for you, it, it's not time to go. It's for you. For some of you, it's time to say, I, I'm going to get involved. I'm going to be part of this. I'm going to get involved in the growth track. I'm going to take that step. And it's time to start set roots. It's setting roots. Or it's, sometimes it's time to uproot. And then he says sometimes it's there's a season to heal, a season to kill, a season to build, a season to tear down. If, you, if you're in your home and you're doing these simultaneously, build and tear down, that's called remodeling, right? <laughs> that's no fun. All kinds of things happen there. There's a time to laugh. There's a time to weep. There's a time to dance. There's a time to mourn. In my job, my profession, this happens sometimes daily or even weekly. I mean, we're this, just two weeks ago, I had somebody came up, said, hey, I just had a baby born. The, just a couple days later, somebody said, my child died. So it happens. And maybe you, live in, you work in a hospital and you see that and it happens, you know, to you and in, around you a lot. But certainly that is a, a season that happens. There's a time to gather and a time to scatter stones. And back in the Bible days, when they would gather stones, it was a, they, were, they were making a, a memorial. They were saying, hey, let's remember this moment. Remember, not always sad, but just remember this moment. Let's, this is a significant day in this relationship. And there's a time to embrace, a time to refrain. There's a time to really be friends and outgoing. There's some, sometimes, you know, there's a spiritual discipline of solitude where you're, you just spend some time with God. Sometimes you put on the hat of, of, of uh, friendship. Sometimes you take that hat off and you have to put on the leadership hat and confront somebody and, and do the difficult thing that's involved. It, sometimes there's a, a season to search and a season to give up. If you've ever part of, been part of a rescue team effort, that can be a difficult time. Hey, is this, is this the time to give up? Do we, do we, is there no more? There's a time to keep and a time to throw away. Some of you, you haven't ever gotten to this place of learning how to throw away anything. I mean, your house is filled with stuff, right? Under your bed, it's there. It's at the end of your bed. It's in your closets are overflowing. It's in your garage. 
And you know what? Studies say one in nine Americans have so much stuff they can't fit it all in their home or their garage, so they get one of these, you know, mobile storage places. And they, they fill that up. They spend an average of $100 a month. There's two and a half billion square footage of mobile storage space. If you were to take all of that stuff, the skis and snowboards and tennis rackets, whatever's in there, and you put it in the Hoover Dam, it would fill the Hoover Dam 28 times. That's a lot of stuff. And you know, when, and when, a, when a keeper marries somebody who likes to throw away, sparks fly, right? Where'd that go? <coughs> you haven't used that in years, but you never know, you know? I, <laughs> There's a time to mend, a time to tear. In the, in, the old, in the Bible days, when their heart was torn, they would tear their clothes. I mean, they just ripped their clothes. It didn't matter what they were wearing, just rip it. Because it was just, that was their, their, their outward expression of what was happening inside. He says there's a time to speak and a time to be silent. And their wisdom to know the difference here. Sometimes you need to speak up. You're at work. You know you need to speak up. You need to be bold. You need to be courageous. You need to share your story in some situation in a family gathering. And then there's times when you need to learn, hey, this is my moment to be quiet, just to listen. So he kind of talks about that. There's a time to love and a time to hate, even a time to hate. You go, you were supposed to hate as, as Christians? Yeah. Not people, but we're to hate some of the things people do. God says we're to hate prejudice. We're to hate racism. We're to hate injustice. It should bother you. It's not right. He says, and it's really an act of love to hate. Because you're saying that's not acceptable. Somebody says a joke. It's really a racist joke. And, but they candy coated it. You go, that's not funny. Because it's not. You, that's, you go, hey, I, I, I draw the line right there. No way. It's, God says that it's, it's wrong to take unborn lives. It's, the murdering of, un, of the unborn happens all over in the United States. You go, Andy, you're getting political on me. Well, it happens to be a political issue, no doubt. But listen, it's really a moral issue. If you go back, for example, the issue of slavery, before the Civil War in the North, not everybody was against slavery, and there, there was like all of these uh, variations. And a lot of it was centered around not morality, but about legality. Was it constitutional? And that was the big conversation. And then what brought the Civil War to a head was when most of the people in the North started figuring out, this is not a legal issue. This is not a political. This is a moral issue. It's a more, and it galvanized the country. And it helped them move forward in that direction. Same thing happened with the civil rights. Eisenhower, that's what got him stuck. Is he kept thinking it was, it was a constitutional issue. And how, you know, is it legal? And how do we go? And we probably should do it for legal reasons. No, no. It might be illegal, but it's mostly a moral issue. And this is exactly the situation with killing the unborn. It's a moral issue. So you need to, that's, that's just all there is to it. You know, in Proverbs 6, he, God lists seven things that he hates. In Malachi, he says that he hates divorce. Not divorced people, obviously, but he hates divorce because of what it does to people. How it rips families and hurts people so horribly. And so is, it, is there a place to hate? There certainly is. There's a time for peace and a time for war, he says. And there's sometimes that, War is unjustified. We have no business being in a war. Sometimes it is. When there's terrible human right violations and injustices. He said all those, so he says everything is appropriate. Not everything is appropriate, but only in its time. This is important. If you, don't, if you leave off the last part, then you go, well, everything's not appropriate. Yeah, but in its time, God starts to do his will. He starts to take even bad things and work it in and makes good things come out of it. You go, even a divorce, yeah. Even an illness, yeah. Even that financial disaster, yeah. Even that, you know, that emotional uh, depression that I felt, yeah. Or that I'm in, yeah. What, 
no matter what it is. God uses all of those things in his time. Number two, affirm my faith in confusing times. Certainly, we all have confusing times. It's difficult to see ahead. You just kind of, your windshield is like, I shouldn't even be driving right now. You know, it's just too clear. I can't see anything. It's confusing. And you affirm your faith in those moments. He says, though God has planted eternity in the hearts of men, even so man cannot see the whole scope of God's work. So just because you can't see it, you can't see the whole scope, doesn't mean you lose your faith. He says, no, God's planted eternity in our hearts, which means we, we think about the future. We think about eternity. Your dog doesn't. Your cat is not thinking about retirement. You know, uh, do I have enough for retirement? No. Your, 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 your animal, your pet, just wants to know when he's going to be fed next or whatever. But for us, because God's done something in us, a part of him is in us, we actually think about it. Oh, what happens after I do? What happens further? Uh, the, you know, and we can't, but he, we, we don't get it. Just like an, we, we're, we're so far above an ant. You look at an ant walking. He, he does, has no idea all the things that we know. And God is that far above us. In fact, if you could understand it all, you would be God. But you're not, nor am I. So he goes, no, there's a difference. But God understands it from beginning to end. He gets the whole thing. He sees the big picture. We do not. What, is, what do you think that is? That, that's right. It's a cocoon. And you know what's interesting about a cocoon is a little animal goes in there and he doesn't come out the same. He really goes in to die. And, it's, and while he's in there, it's dark. It's, 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 it's uncomfortable. It's ugly. It doesn't look very nice. And for some of you, you're in a cocoon. That's what your life looks like. You're, it doesn't look pretty. It doesn't look appropriate or beautiful or anything. It looks wrong. It feels wrong. You have a disability that you feel like you got unfairly. You have an illness that you didn't ask for. You were betrayed when you were faithful. And one thing after another, we just, we look at it and all we see is the ugliness. And God says, there's actually a bigger picture. He can take something that's ugly, something that we don't like, some darkness where our future has been ripped from us and we don't feel, we've lost hope. And he takes it and he makes a butterfly. He makes something beautiful come out of it. Well, how does he do that? Well, he's God. Thank the Lord. It's not, we can't do that. But God can do it. Because he makes things beautiful in his time. In his time. Not in our time. We, it's not how it works. John, Jesus says in the book of John, he says, he's talking to his disciples. He says, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. They, they couldn't, all they were going into some really tough time, very confusing moments. Jesus is going to be crucified. They're going to be on the run. They're going to be hunted. They're going to have shame. All kinds of things going on. He was, you know, he tried to help them a little bit. He goes, in the end, you're not going to get it. In the moment, all you're going to see is a cocoon. He goes, but there will be a time when you'll look back and you'll realize, I was in the process of becoming a butterfly. And we see that start to happen in Acts chapter 2. And then you start reading the New Testament. You go, dang, man, there's a butterfly going on. But in that moment, all they could see was the cocoon. Here, Paul's talking about a thorn in the flesh. Some of you have a thorn in the flesh, right? You don't have to look at them right now, but, you know, you're thinking, I got one, you know, thorn in the flesh. Well, Paul's, he's talking about his thorn in the flesh. He says it's a messenger of Satan. He wasn't married, so he's not talking about his spouse, right? To torment me. Three times, he says, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. He probably didn't want to hear that. But it, because he prayed three times. I'm not sure if that came all three times or at the end, but he gets it. He goes, okay, I need to recognize God is at work in this particular situation. This thorn, this difficulty, this hardship, this affliction in my life. God is at work to do something in it. What is he doing? 
He says, therefore, this is Paul saying, okay, I get it. He goes, I will boast all the more gladly about what? My weaknesses. Who says that? Right? Who says that? Yeah, I boast in my weaknesses. Uh, are you uh, getting uh, mental health care? I mean, what's going on with you? But he goes, no, no. Why? So that Christ's power may rest on me. He goes, that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weakness. So he boasts in it. Now he says, I delight in it, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, even in difficulties, for when I am weak, what? Yeah, God's strength works somehow through that whole process. I don't always understand it, but God is at work at it. God's doing something in it. And God is doing that in your life. Here's what happens, though. If you resist it, this process doesn't happen. If you just resist it and you're angry and you're always questioning God and you're, you're, you, you, you never get to the place where Paul, he prayed several times and he finally said, you know what? I recognize that, you know, God's doing something through this. And God is doing something in your life. You're in this place of pain. You know, the carpet's been pulled out from under you. And the future looks so bleak. And God is involved in your life. You're a cocoon, and God is going to do a transformation in you. And that's part of believing in what God's going to do. That's what Paul had to wrestle with. It didn't come right away for him. And he's describing it. He's going, I'm in all this difficulty. In fact, he kind of comes to the conclusion, it doesn't really matter what comes. Hardship, persecution, difficult, all of it. I'm going to recognize that God is involved in it. He said, this happens so that we might trust, not in ourselves, but in God. Learning to trust. This is really what it's about. We go through difficulties. We recognize that God's in both the good and the bad. And even in confusing times, we affirm our faith and we say, God, I, I'm going to trust you. We have a person in our church, been a member for many years. And uh, he's gone through some difficult stuff, some of it recently. Very, very hard, tough hardships. And I asked him, I said, would you share your story with us about some of the pain, some of the difficulties you've gone through and how Christ has worked in your life through that process? He, evolved, he said, yeah, I'll be happy to do that. And would you listen to Dexter McNair's story? Watch this. One of the darkest days was most definitely when I was 10 years old, when my babysitter, who was a girl around 18, she decided to molest me. Sadly, that experience set, set me on a path of promiscuity and perversion. I guess at 13 I started smoking and drank pretty much every day. My dad was also the local pornographic photographer. So I was also introduced to pornography at a very young age. So my life was on this vicious cycle for many years. In my early 20s I would indulge in being a male exotic dancer and model. And I started with cocaine in 88, I divorced from my wife. I, don't know, I moved away from New York and started a new life in Virginia. And in 1991, I believe it was, I met my second wife. My son, Jordan, he was born in 97, I believe it was. It was around that time I began heavily drinking. I had tried rehab a few times and just wasn't finding traction. My marriage was in shambles. My wife and I were seemingly fighting daily. I had my second divorce probably in 2003. My life was in spiral downhill, spiritually, emotionally, financially. See, I was dating and living what seemed to be, you know, a normal life, but what others didn't know, I was tormented. And at this time, I was paying two child supports, living in a one-bedroom studio apartment. I only could afford to eat, pay rent, I have enough money to buy beer, liquor, and cigarettes. I had heard about Vineyard from a friend of mine decided to start visiting. I would come to Vineyard on Sunday and sit in the back, and I would just cry each and every service. But little did I know, God was getting ready to do something in my life. I didn't even see it coming. I was able to get into the over 40 singles group at Vineyard where I met so many wonderful people and was able to start getting on track. I was devoting time to reading my word, truly walking the walk with the Lord. I began to be able to find 
freedom from some of the strongholds in my life. A couple of years ago, when I lost my 20-year-old son, Jordan, in a car accident, that was a true test. Destroyed my entire world as I knew it. It was a perfect opportunity for me to pick up and drink, but God had another plan for me. It flashed in my head too for about 1.2 seconds. And that was the end of that thought. I could remember it so clearly. On my birthday, actually August 9th, I was 43. God took away the desire for nicotine and for alcohol. And after that night, it was a different craving. Because I noticed on that next day, on the 10th, I was not bound by those things any longer. And I met an amazing woman, Tish, now married to Tish. She supports me in more ways than I could ever imagine. Thank you, Tish, for your love and your patience. And then Jim Payne, he invited me to join the life safety team at Vineyard. I decided to go to, through the growth track and join the team. And now I spend my time reaching out to help others. Was my life painful? <laughs> Very much so. But the joy I get now, you know, serving on a life safety team, touching others in their lives, is priceless. You know, my family at Vineyard it was a key piece of healing in my story. And I'm thankful that God still wants to use me, despite of my past. That's a great story, isn't it? I love that. You know, it's not easy to do to be vulnerable like that, but healing happens because we connect with that. We go, I can see uh, if God can do that in his life because that's, he was in a cocoon. That's a tough place to be at. Notice he said that the vineyard church played a key role. Listen, he talked about going into a small group. That was the entryway for him to find healing that God had for him. Some of you, you need to be involved in a small group. We just started our semester last week, so it's still beginning. People are still moving around trying to find a group that they want. This is the moment for you to get involved. And on the way out, you can see our board up there getting involved in a small group. That's the place for you. That's part of what God has for you, is to, for you to step into your healing. It says, this is a different translation. The NIV says, he has made everything beautiful in his time. It's not everything is beautiful, and we know that. But in his time, in his time, God can make things beautiful. He can take ashes and make something beautiful. Number three, steward all my time as God's gift. All my time. Your time is important because it's your life. That is your life. It's way more important than money. You can always get more money. You cannot get more time. That is a gift that God has given you. All of us should eat and drink and enjoy what you've worked for. It is God's gift. What do you do with a gift? You open it up, right? You don't just stare at it. And it's a gift and you use it. And he goes, that's what your life is. It's a gift. And he wants you to use it and enjoy it. He says, however many years a man may live, let him enjoy them all. God doesn't want you just to endure and, and, and grin and bear it. He wants you to enjoy life. He really does. That's why part of our value is to choose joy. It's something you have to choose. You, it doesn't automatically come. You make a decision each day. God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And then he says, be grateful for every year you live. Some of you, that's your, you know, when you turn on your birthday, the next, you know, when you turn whatever you're going to turn, this is your verse. Especially if you have one of those big decadal ones, you know, like, oh no, I'm turning 30 or 40. It's, it's scary, right? This, you need this verse like posted everywhere, right? Because it's God wants you to be grateful for it. Look at this guy, billionaire. Let me, let me pose a question. Let's say this guy, your banker calls you on Monday and says, hey, a, a, an anonymous billionaire, this guy, uh, de has decided he's going to deposit money into your account. You go, wow, money, how much? Well, quite a bit, actually. $86,000, $86,400 every day. You go, oh my goodness, that's incredible. 
I can buy whatever I want. Yep, anything you want. $86,000, $86,400. He goes, here's the one catch, though, the banker says. If you don't spend it in that day, it reverts back to the bank. You don't get it. So if that was you, how many of you think you could put a dent in that money? Let me see. Yeah, you'd start thinking, yeah, yeah, I have some ideas. I could get close every day, though. Dang, that's so much. Well, your heavenly Father has deposited into your account 86,400 seconds every day. That's what makes up 24 hours. And it's a gift. And he wants you to use it. And it doesn't roll over to the next day. He wants you to use it for that day. And, and, uh, and it's the most important, valuable resource you have. And because it's the most valuable resource you have, it stands to reason that the greatest sin is by wasting it. When you kill time, you're really, it's a form of committing suicide. You're just saying, well, hey, my life isn't that important. I'm just going to waste these, I'm just going to waste this life, this time that God has given me. Paul says, I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. You know, it's interesting about this verse because it tells us a little bit about Paul. Because earlier in the book, he says, I thank God for y'all, which means he's from the South, right? <laughs> but here, we've discovered he's not from Texas because a Texan would never say this, that I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. <laughs> They're only happy in Texas, right? So I don't know how hermeneutically sound that is, but... But notice, he says, I have learned. I have learned. It's, you know what? Contentment doesn't come naturally for any of us. Not for me, not for you. It's something we learn. And God helps us to learn that. What does that mean? It means that we're not comparing ourselves to others. See, other people, they have a different assignment. They have a different thing they're doing. And that's between them and God. Your assignment. Well, God, as you stay focused on that, and so you're not comparing, and you don't complain and gripe all the time about how hard it is and how you're a victim and how you never have enough time, which is what we all do, right? But we got to be careful. He says, hey, that's, that's a learned thing. You can learn to do that. You can learn to undo that, where you stop comparing and you stop complaining about how little time you have. You don't have enough time. He says, no, learn contentment, that you, God has an assignment for you, write this down if you would. I have just enough time to do what God wants me to do with my life. I have just enough time to do what God wants me to do with my life. No more, no less. So, if that's true, which it is, that God gives you an assignment and then gives you enough of your life, enough time to fulfill that assignment, what that means, if you say, I am too busy, what that means is either... One, you are doing things you shouldn't be doing. God never intended you to be doing. You're frittering away your time, and that way you don't have time to do the things God wants you to do. So you're too busy. Number two is you're doing the right thing in the wrong way. You're doing the right thing. It's what you're supposed to be doing, but you need to reevaluate. You need to do it differently. You need to... Uh, do it more efficiently. You need to, you're spending, you know, you're a perfectionist, and so you're spending way too much time on one thing. So it's the right thing, but you're not doing it right. So that's, but it's true that God has given you enough time, so you need to evaluate. What needs to go? What do I need to, hey, there's things I'm doing that I don't need to be doing. And you know, one of the beautiful things about fasting is, and there's different types of fasting, obviously. There's food fasting, but there's other fasts, and we always have a 21 days of prayer and fasting to kick off the year in January, is when people, when we give up stuff, we start to evaluate, we start, all of a sudden you realize, wow, that was kind of a problem for me. A lot of my time was going there. A lot of my emotional energy. And one of the things that we should be doing when we go without something, and you don't have to wait to January to go without something, right? Is you evaluate, is this, Maybe this isn't good for me. Maybe, maybe I don't need this in my life. Or maybe I need less of it. But it's a good, that's a good thing to do, to be evaluating. Should I be letting this go? And number two, should I be doing something differently? Good questions to be asking. Number four, this is anticipate giving an account of my time to God. We do give an account. We do stand before God for the life that he's given us. And we give an account for that. Here's what 
we read in Ecclesiastes, he says, God will call the past to an account. So each one of us, every one of us, when we die, we'll stand before God. God will be the judge of the good and the bad because a time for every purpose and for every work has been fixed by him. And so we need, we're going to give an account for the time we have. It matters. Now, in the Bible, as you read it, you realize that it doesn't matter for everybody. You see, somebody who has put their faith in Christ, and they've, all of a sudden they have meaning and reason for living, then it really, really matters. For somebody who is, is, is not a believer, they're not a Christian, really, they are wasting their time. The problem is, being a good time management is the least of their problems. They've got, they've, they're going to face God, and they're not going to be right with him. Because, see, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, and there's where that judgment of sin happened. So when we put our faith in Christ, that judgment has already happened. Our sin was judged, and it was judged on Jesus Christ, even though he lived a perfect life, even though he didn't sin. The judgment was passed on to him. He took that judgment for us. So when we die, that judgment's already happened. There is no judgment on, on salvation. You, you walk right into heaven. However, there's, even though you're not judged on sin, you're still judged on service. There's still, how did you live your life? And that's an important thing that each one of us need to, to rectify. It says each of us will give an account of himself to God. All of us will. He says, live then with a due sense of responsibility. Now notice he says, not as those who don't know the meaning of life. In other words, the people that they're just living life for themselves. They've, they've, not, they've not recognized what Christ did for them on the cross. They've not settled that issue about sin in their life and keeps them from God. He says, no, not, but he's saying, no, he's talking about people that have, you've settled that issue. You've put your faith in Christ. But as those who do, make the best use of your time, which you could say of your life. And so each one of us, we need to, we need to say, hey, I, need to, I know there's good and bad, and God works through both of them, especially in due time, in season. God's going to do something. Even in confusing times, that's the time to affirm my faith, even when it seems scary and seems unjust. And there's all these reasons why I could hold my fist up at heaven and be angry at God. Instead, I do what Paul did when he said he had that thorn in the flesh. He goes, hey, I get it. Some things, they don't seem right. I don't understand it. I'm in the cocoon at this point, but I'm going to affirm my faith, and I'm going to use my time as a gift. It's something that God's given to me, and so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to steward that the very, very best I can, and that's, that's how we manage the unmanageables. It's really tough, but it really begins with a faith statement on our saying, God, I, will, I believe you're involved in my life. I believe even in the tough places. Okay, let's bow our heads and pray. I'm going to ask you, if you would, just to bow your heads and everybody close your eyes, if you would, as we just take this moment and pray. We're just going to go to God and say, God, would you do that? Say, maybe you didn't see God in the difficult places, in the bad seasons. Maybe that's the season you're in now. And you just say, God, I accept that your plan for my life includes both good and bad, both good and bad in my life. And when you say, God, I, I want to affirm my faith in you, even when I don't understand what's going on. Some of you, you are in that cocoon. Your future looks bleak. Emotionally, you're devastated. Maybe you're contemplating leaving your spouse because you don't see any other way. Maybe you're contemplating uh, doing something that's self-destructive because the pain you're in, you don't know any other way to solve it. Maybe you're thinking you're somehow less valuable because of the divorce or the way you were treated, the betrayal, the financial loss, whatever it is. And God says that he, you have incredible value. That's why he died for you on the cross. God would never make that level of sacrifice for something that didn't matter. You matter to him. 
So I'm going to pray with some of you. You need prayer. I want to pray with you. I want to lead you in a prayer where you're saying, hey, I'm ready to put my faith in Christ. I'm not there. I'm far from God. Maybe you're just far from him. Maybe years ago you felt close, but today you're not there. And God's saying, it's time to come home. In fact, the Holy Spirit has been working on you. If you really are honest with yourself, while we've been looking at God's word, the Holy Spirit's been drawing some of you saying, this is your moment. This is your time. It's time to get right with him. And I want to pray with you. So I'm going to ask you to let me know in just a moment. I'm going to ask you just, just to let me know by just lifting your hand up and just saying, hey, I want, I want you to pray for me. I want you to lead me in prayer so I know who I'm praying for. Okay, this isn't about joining the church. This is about you getting right with God. Okay? This is, I'm not going to ask you to come forward or stand up, but I am going to ask you just to say, Andy, include me in that prayer. Okay, and so this is your moment right now. Raise your hand if you want me to be praying for you, just so I know who I'm praying for. Bless you. It's two, three, four, five, several in the back. Bless you. Over, way over on the other side. Anybody else? You say, I want to be included in that prayer. That's an important. Yep, I see you. Okay, I, I want you to cl- put your hand down now. I'm going to lead you in prayer. Pray this. Say, Heavenly Father, Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for me, to be judged for my sin. Today, I want to walk in the newness of life by following Christ. Would you say, I open up my heart for your Holy Spirit. Just cleanse my conscience. And give me hope. And then I also want to pray for those of you who are in a cocoon. You you are a Christ follower, but it's, it's where you're at. It's a place of pain, a place of darkness. You don't see a future. You're contemplating, contemplating leaving, running away something self-destructive. And I can tell you right now, that's probably not the answer. God's great work that he's doing to make a butterfly does not include running away. It includes what Paul's talking about, the thorn of the flesh, saying, I'm going to let my weakness, I'm going to delight in that. I mean, that's so contrary. There's nothing in us that naturally does that. That's why it's a work of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to invite you to just pray right now. You say, God, help me to embrace the place I'm in now, to not resist you, not put up a fist to heaven, to recognize that you make all things beautiful in your time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.